there's a fair amount of ground to cover uh, with our presentation. And so um, we'll get moving on that here shortly. But a few things I want to quickly talk about or sort of uh, set us up for uh, with this new City Clerk Study Hall webinar series that we're doing. Um, and so this is the first one. I ask for you all to put some patience as we kind of figure out the best way to, to uh, offer these going forward. We're planning so far to do one of these per quarter, so four per year. And the main reason the league decided to do this is um, we have seen in the last few months here uh, an extremely high amount of turnover in the city clerk position. And it's a position in city government that's always had a high amount of turnover, but uh, recently it's definitely spiked. And we're seeing a lot of brand new city clerks out there across the state. And I think anyone who's been a city clerk before would say that the first time you do it, it's very different and very new. You need a lot of training and education. So this uh, aim, the, the goal of this, of these uh, study halls is to just have quarterly kind of uh, different training, different topics, Q, a lot of questions, a lot of Q&A. That's really going to be the main point. And so that is my next point here with today's uh, presentation and, set, and study hall is I'm gonna do a quick sort of overview of the city clerk duties and responsibilities. It will be a basic overview. So if any veterans are on this, um, you probably know most of the things we'll be covering, but the we'll get to questions and answers toward the end. And we did get a whole bunch of questions submitted when folks registered, which is great. There are, I'll say right now, there's far too many than we have time for today. Uh, so I try to consolidate those as best as possible. Uh, to get to as many as we can. Also, obviously, everyone, you know, myself and Amanda in membership services, we can take questions um, offline anytime you want. Uh, that's our role here at the League of Cities. Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Uh, so again, this presentation is really focused on the basics of the city clerk position, the duties and responsibilities. I borrowed heavily from Cindy Kendall, who used to be a city clerk and finance officer uh, for cities. Is, then worked for Iowa State Extension in the league in a shared role, and she did a lot of training for city clerks. She did this presentation several different times over the years, and so I really just borrowed from her materials. She's a legend. She's in the league's Hall of Fame. Uh, so uh, if some of you have worked with Cindy over the years, you, you would certainly support that. And so I just want to acknowledge her work in helping uh, with the content of this presentation. Um, and uh, we'll get started on it if I can get back to my PowerPoint. So that's me. In case you haven't met me, that photo is getting a little dated now. I think my I definitely have less hair and it's definitely more gray than I have left. Had to get rid of the beard there. It's turning out to be a Santa Claus beard now. So uh, anyways, uh, if you ever need to contact me, that's how you can do so. Um, a few things before we really get into the meat of the presentation here, and especially for those of you that are brand new to city clerks and brand new to city government, it's going to be different than anything you've done previously in any other work that you've done, um, mainly because working in the public sector is different, uh, much different than the public, private sector. Uh, the city clerk position itself is one of the oldest uh, positions in municipal government around, might be the oldest, um, and it's vital. It's vital for the big cities. It's vital for the small cities. Uh, somebody has to do behind the scenes work that their their citizens probably don't really realize is happening, but somebody has to do it. For most of our cities out there that are on the smaller side, Iowa is a state of smaller cities. The city clerk is really doing it all. Um, most of our cities don't have a lot of staff. They might have two, three, four full timers. And the city clerk is going to be handling a lot of the administrative and financial tasks for the city government. For most people who haven't done this work before, it's a surprising amount of work. Uh, that goes into it. And so that's just true for everyone that joins us. So if you're brand new, you're feeling overwhelmed, I'm not here to say that um, it's going to get easier anytime soon, but you will, it will get better. You will get more experience. You will start to get a handle on things and things will get quicker and you'll be, get more efficient. But it is a huge learning curve for pretty much everyone who starts out as a city clerk. The other things about working in public sector that are different, if you haven't before, is transparency. Um, everything you do, everything your city council decides has to be done in an open, transparent fashion. 
that is a big change or a big difference from the private sector, which may have shareholders or a board of directors or something like that. But in large part, you're not open to your average citizen. They can't walk into a private company and say, let me look at your budget. Let me look at your financial transactions. Let me look at your CEO's travel log, things like that. Those are not public documents, of course. But in the private and public sector, pretty much everything you do is going to be open to the public. It is an adjustment for those new to this world. Um, you serve all of the public too. You know, a, a private company, they can in some ways pick and choose who their clients are or who their customers are. But when you work for a city government, all of your residents, all of your property owners, you have to serve them, whether you want to or not, whether they are your biggest fans or your biggest critics, you still have to provide them public service. And so that is another adjustment for those that are new to this world. So what does it look like in city government? Then this is kind of a very big picture uh, look at it, but everything starts with your citizens. The citizens, you're serving your citizens, I, as I just spoke about, you don't have a choice on who you serve. You have to provide public services to your citizens equally and consistently. And so everything starts with them. The citizens then elect the mayor and council. They choose who represents them on the city council. And then the city council, of course, sets the city budget, all the different codes, the laws of the city government, the policies of the city government, the regulations, the programs, the services. What do we need to add? What do we need to get rid of? All of that is done at the city council. And of course, the council represents the citizens who elect them. The council then and the mayor sets directives through their decision-making powers and directs the staff to carry those directives out. Uh, the budget's a prime example of that. It's city council sets their budget pretty much right now. We're in budget season, so hopefully you're well on your way to finalizing your city budget. And then through that budget, you allocate your resources to fund all the different things your city does, improving roads and providing clean water, public safety, uh, parks and recs and uh, rec recreation programs, trails, libraries, swimming pools, uh, all kinds of different things that cities out there do every single day of the week. Uh, so that's what the staff does. They carry out the directives and the orders of the council to provide the services that your citizens demand. Um, and then lastly, you have all the programs and services that I just mentioned, which can be vastly different from city to city. You'll hear league staff say this all the time. Not, ones, not, not every city is alike. Uh, not every city has a police department. Not every city has its own library. Not every city has a swimming pool or a municipal golf course. Um, some do, some don't. And there's going to be some differences from town to town to town. And that's great. Um, you have the freedom, for the most part, with, it, with municipal home rule to determine what to provide and what not to provide to your citizens. And so that's uh, reflective of each community out there. So the city clerk, again, I kind of alluded to this before that they do a lot more than most people realize. And one of these old kind of phrases that people talk or use is chief cook and bottle washer. Um, what, another one you'll also often hear, and this is actually a story in the Cedar Rapids Gazette last September that featured uh, Tanya from Swisher, um, uh, called the city clerk the hub of their city government. And that's something that we have often always say at the league as well, because the city clerk um, has some uh, significant duties uh, and specific duties coming from the state code that we'll talk about later. But in large part, their duties expand far past that. They're handling all sorts of different things. They are in the middle of it all. They're expected to know it all, uh, whether it's city, the city budget, city accounting, the programs and services the city offers, taking care of utility billing, pet tags, and on and on and on and on and on. Um, they're also, because of the nature of the job, usually the person that's most available to the public. They, the city clerk is typically at City Hall. City Hall, of course, is an open facility to the public. When somebody needs something from their city or they, need a, they have a bill to pay, a fine to pay, whatever the case may be, they go into City Hall typically uh, and they communicate, interact with the city clerk. And so there's a lot of public interaction. A lot of it's good. Sometimes it's not so good. Uh, but that's just part of the job. Um, 
they're also um, by state code, but also by city policy, typically required to be sort of the chief organizer of the city in many different fashions. Um, sometimes it's record retention. All the city records that the city possesses have to be organized, maintained in a thoughtful manner. Um, typically that goes to the city clerk to handle. Coordinating all of the city's activities in some fashion usually is something the city clerk is at least going to assist with, if not be fully in charge of. Uh, so there's a lot of organizing and, and coordinating. Um, as we talked about, I alluded to some specific duties to get everything done, and we'll talk about those here later on in the presentation. Um, and the other thing, too, that this is something some of your veteran city clerks will kind of kid about, but it's very serious at the same time, is uh, you're going to get other duties as assigned from the council. Um, and there's too many examples, uh, local examples to, to name, but cities get faced with all kinds of questions from the public. Why doesn't the city do this? Why doesn't the city do that? Oftentimes the clerk or the council rather will then look at the clerk and say, why don't you go research this thing, this idea or this uh, concern that's coming from our citizens? And then off you go, not something you planned on working on or doing research on, but the council has asked you to do it. This just comes with the job. So these are the specific things we are going to dive into next. Um, some of the, again, a lot of this high level overview uh, but we will talk about some of the specific stuff, especially the state code duties that uh, are assigned to the city clerk. But we'll start at the federal level. And the reason we start there is something, that, especially if you're new to this whole world, the way it works in terms of um, the kind of power structure in government. Federal laws and regulations are at the top. Then it goes to the state code and state regulations and then local codes, city codes and regulations. So everything kind of funnels down from this federal to the state to the local. So again, I alluded to this before, we have municipal home rule in Iowa, which largely says cities have the power to adopt codes and regulations and policies as long as they do not conflict with or supersede a state code. So we have a lot of freedom to adopt local codes and policies, but they cannot be in conflict with or superseding a state law or a federal law. So you always got to be mindful of that. So there's some big, basic sort of... Um, employment laws and federal laws that may govern some of the things you do as a city government. We list them out here. Don't have nearly enough time to really dive into each one of these, but just be aware of that. Um, when you are operating as an organization, things like the Fair Labor Standards Act are going to apply. Same with sometimes the Family Medical and Leave, Family and Medical Leave Act, although that one has a big asterisk next to it because it only can uh, is mandated on employers with 50 or more employees that live within a 75 mile radius of the place of employment. So most of our smaller cities are not required to adhere to the FMLA. You can choose to adopt the FMLA uh, policies if you want to for those cities. But then there's other cities, of course, that have more than 50 employees and they must follow the FMLA. And then the there's other uh, big federal laws like the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the subsequent amendments that can govern all sorts of things, both as an, a, a, a within your employment of employees, but also working with the public. ADA has some uh, requirements related to accessibility to public facilities uh, and parks and parking lots and things like that, that uh, will can impact, will certainly impact you as a city government. Same with water quality. Uh, there's different water quality standards that start at the federal level and come trickle down, pun intended, uh, to local government in terms of what you provide and treat locally um, when it comes to drinking water and wastewater. Another one is transportation. Uh, I alluded to this with uh, the ADA and then some of the accessibility and design standards um, that come with that and it can impact your transportation design and your infrastructure work with roads and bridges and sidewalks. Uh, similar uh, with community development and housing. Sometimes you know, there's gonna be some federal laws that impact the way you do conduct community development slash housing development work in your community. And then there's all sorts of different funding programs out there that are available to cities, whether that be transportation, housing, city facilities like fire stations. Um, this is a quick uh, time or a note time to note that the league has a federal funding consultant named Bill Goldie, which I'm sure some of you have worked with. Um, that's helped cities on in any number of ways, uh, 
primarily with ARPA, because the city's got their hands on directly some funds, federal funds through that act, but also oh, there's all kinds of other programs that Bill can help you with um, identifying potential funding opportunities through the federal agencies. Then we get down to the state level. This is where the rubber really meets the road in terms of some, some of the specific things that are mandated from the state code in for city governments. And that includes a handful of things for the city clerk position where the city clerk is identified in a state code to do X, Y, Z. One of those is to produce or to at least um, coordinate the production of the council meeting minutes. The state code in section 372.13 subsection six requires cities to publish uh, council meeting minutes within 15 days of a council meeting. For cities less than 200 population, you can post those. There's a little bit of a difference there. Um, that just, and it says to cause to publish. You have to get it to the newspaper within 15 days of a council meeting. And that says the city clerk shall do that. Uh, we get asked occasionally what happens if the city clerk position is vacant or absent. Well, then somebody has to do it. But typically, the city clerk is going to be responsible for that. And in most cases, nearly every city, the city clerk, him or herself, is going to be the person actually writing the minutes and producing them uh, for the city. Sometimes a deputy clerk may be in charge of that, especially if somebody, again, if somebody's absent, the city clerk is absent or the position is vacant. But typically, it's going to be the city clerk that handles all of it. Authenticating measures, what does that mean? For the most part, that means authenticating, basically attesting to and signing ordinances, resolutions, and the minutes. Anything that's like officially done by your council, you need to authenticate it to kind of make it authentic that this is this occurred the way this ordinance reads. I'm putting my name to it as city clerk. I'm going to authenticate it by doing so. Okay, so that's the clerk's job um, to make sure that happens and make sure it's real. That this this is what happened. Our council approved this ordinance. Our council approved this resolution. I'm going to sign my name to it. That authenticates it. Um, also, handling the oath of office and, and public official bonds. Every election, this question comes up repeatedly. Amanda would certainly acknowledge this. Uh, we just had city elections last November, of course. A whole bunch of new council members and mayors joined the ranks. Uh, also, a whole bunch of people got reelected. All of them have to take the oath of office prior to starting their new terms of office. This also applies for vacancies. Uh, there's a lot of vacancies that occur um, among council members and mayors throughout their tenure. Uh, people resign their seat for various reasons. You, that creates a vacancy. You can either appoint somebody to fill that vacancy or um, uh, fill it via a special election. Whoever takes that new that seat midterm, they also have to take the oath of office prior to uh, joining the council. The other part to that is some city officials have to be bonded, which is basically an insurance provision for errors and omissions. The two that every city has to have bonded is the mayor and the city clerk, um, mainly because the mayor is identified in state code. So that's one that's no bones about it. The other one that I, why we say city clerks is um, the guidance has always been that anyone who has the, the ability to control and disperse public funds needs to be bonded. So for the vast majority of cities out there, that's going to be the city clerk. So that's part of the state code requirements as well. Um, the state code state code also has different um, employment laws. We talked about the federal level. There's kind of the big framework of employment laws. So the state laws also get into that and sort of govern um, employers in different fashions. So a lot of your job duties and descriptions will reflect that. Um, and so you got to make sure that those are up to date and uh, meet the state code requirements. Uh, there's also some big general accounting requirements we'll talk about later on um, that cities are uh, um, have to adhere to. And I, again, since most city clerks are kind of in charge of the financial transactions and accounting for the city government. And so they're the ones that have to comply with those state codes. And then the next one, too, that um, there's big overarching open meetings and open records laws that all local governments must follow. And at the city level, most of those are gonna be in, in managed by the city clerk. The city council is gonna rely on the city clerk to make sure that their meetings are, uh, are being done correctly according to the open meetings laws. The same with handling open records and making sure the city complies with the open records laws. 
it's a lot. I know we're only a few slides in. You're probably already starting to scratch your heads for you new folks thinking, what the heck did I get myself into? But wait, there's more. <laughs> there's more good news to share. Uh, so now we're finally at the city level. And this is where I talked about home rule before, where your council has um, a fair amount of freedom to really manage their city as they see fit. And the way they do that is through ordinances, resolutions, and motions. Ordinances are law. That's basically the best way to look at it is that's the laws of the city. You have laws, uh, codes, city codes that dictate things like parking, where people can park and where they cannot park. Um, and there's plenty more than that, but that's an easy way of looking at it. Resolutions then are policy statements. Those are policies like employment policies, any kind of thing that would go in your employee handbook. Um, the holidays that the city employees have, uh, holiday, uh, 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 vacation time off, sexual harassment policies. Those are all policies that are adopted by your resolution and uh, should note here for both ordinances and resolutions, your city council can amend those whenever they like. They can come back and look at what's existing in your policy handbooks uh, or your city code book and say, we need to make a tweak here or there, or we need to repeal that ordinance because it's no longer you know, fits what we want, okay, they can go back and repeal it or they can amend it through the legislative process at the city council level. And then motions are really just routine uh, approvals for just routine matters, um, building permits, uh, sometimes are folded into the consent agenda. You probably have heard that term by now. Uh, and that's just sort of just a routine, quick thing, non-controversial. We don't really need to discuss it. Let's just, so you just use a motion uh, procedural type things to move the meeting along. All right, I'm going to pause there for a second. So we got a couple of questions that have come in here before we get into our next topic. Um, FMLA, does that 50 plus employees include your temps, lifeguards, and volunteer fire department? Yes, it does include anyone who can be identified as a city employee, um, which a lot of cities use seasonal staff in the summer times to uh, do parks and rec type things. Lifeguards, prime example of that. Uh, so they would count volunteer firefighters. They are counted as employees by the IRS. Why? Well, you do treat them as employees when it comes to things like workers' compensation insurance. They are covered by the city government um, under your workers' compensation policy. And so they are treated as an employee. So you got to count them as an employee. Next question here. Um, state law says the mayor and clerk need to be bonded. This one, Jesse, thank you. It's a good question. It's always a little bit confusing on the clerk side of this. Mayors are specifically identified in Chapter 64 of the state code that they have to be bonded um, by the city government. So that's that one's no question. Now, the clerk is a little less certain, but what I was saying before is the guidance from auditors and city attorneys for years has been the, the intent of public official bonding is for errors and emissions, basically an insurance policy for errors and emissions by public officials. And so the big part of that is not fraudulent misuse of funds, but just misuse of funds out of error, just errors, innocent mistakes, and so on. And so who has control to, to uh, spend city money? Well, in most cities, it's the city clerk. In the larger cities, it might be a finance officer. It might be a team of people. They may have to include all of them. What most cities have through their liability insurance provider is called a blanket bond, where you have the, the various positions who need to be insured or bonded are covered. It's not individual names, but it's the positions. So the best guidance we often say is just check with your liability provider to make sure you've got adequate coverage for the, for the various positions that need it. All right, let's get into city council meetings. Um, just a few basics here. We have a whole bunch of open meetings uh, training and guidance and resources for you on our website. Um, we do presentations on this year round, but just for this presentation, we'll just hit on this very quickly. Um, every meeting must be preceded by a notice that's posted at least 24 hours that includes your tentative agenda. Okay. Minimum 24 hours. Um, the actions of the council must be included in the minutes. This is a very basic statement. We could talk about minutes much in much more detail here. Just note here, though, that um, you must have an accurate representation of a council meeting in your minutes. The bare minimum is the, the vote outcome of anything that they took action on, they voted upon. 
it should also it needs to also include the bills and or the claims and receipts, which is basically your bills and the a summary of your revenues must be in the minutes as well. Um, those minutes must, as I said before, they must be published within 15 days of the meeting. It must be caused to be published. You have to just have to get it to the news newspaper within 15 days. Less than 200 in population, you can post those instead. That's that same um, demarcation applies to public notices as well, like public hearing notices. So if you're less than 200 population, you don't have to publish those. You can post those instead. Um, the minutes must, as I said here, list of all bills approved by the council. Um, the, also the, the summary of the revenues, that's the, that's the receipts. Uh, they call it a summary of receipts. It's basically a summary of your revenues by month, by fund uh, of the city government. We have sample documents. There's a lot of veteran and city clerks out there and mentor city clerks out there that can show you how they do it. There's a lot of great examples of agendas, minutes, how to write these things up, how to summarize discussion. That's probably the trickiest part of doing council meeting minutes is how do I capture the discussion that the council held throughout the meeting, but not transcribe it. Because if you transcribe most city council meetings, you're looking at meetings that would be 20 pages in length, and that's going to be very costly to publish. Um, so most cities try to summarize that, but it's more art than science. All right, we're going to move along here if I can. All right, the next big area we're going to get into is funding. And there's this is another one where we could spend the next several days talking about city budgets and funding and accounting. This is just going to be a big high-level overview. And I'll stop here and encourage everyone again. We have the league has a ton of resources available. We do budget workshops in the fall. Um, upcoming here, we have the uh, Iowa Municipal Finance Officers Association Spring Conference. If you have not joined the IMFOA, I would certainly encourage you to do so. They offer great resources. It's a great association of city clerks and finance, finance officers from around the state. Also, there is something called clerk school. If you haven't heard of that, uh, the Municipal Professionals Institute and Municipal Pro Professionals Academy is the official name. A lot of people call it clerk school. That is held in June through Iowa State University, um, Iowa State Extension. Uh, so look into that as well. The league helps, well, uh, communicates with those groups all throughout the year. So we can point you in the right direction. But if you're really needing, uh, which I'm sure if you're brand new to this, you're going to need more training, look into those options because they really dive into these topics. So today, um, we're just going to get high level stuff. Just be aware of these things and then follow up with more training later. Um, now, fund, fund municipal funding is different in Iowa because we have what was called fund accounting. It's mandated by the state code of Iowa where you have different funds and sub funds and it's very complicated, probably unnecessarily so. However, the reason this was set up the way it was is to help cities provide transparency. Rather than having just one fund do everything for the city, sorry, um, we have fund accounting to break these things up to provide transparency. So the motivation is good and we support that, but it does cause a lot of confusion and it is hard to learn and hard to follow, especially for those new to city government. So just understand that it's, it's on purpose. We have all these different funds and they call program areas, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, and just try to, try to learn it and learn it and learn it some more because that's what it takes. It takes a lot of repetition um, so this is kind of how we break it up. There's different ways to look at it. Some people call it buckets. Um, other people call it like funding streams, like rivers and streams. Doesn't really matter. Just understand that there, this, there's different funds with different labels for different purposes. So the biggest bucket for sure for every city out there is your general fund. Um, that's your operational fund to pay for just sort of everyday stuff, your operational needs, wages and salaries, uh, roads. A lot of stuff comes out of that. Um, public works, public safety, most of what they do is supported by your general fund. The general fund itself is supported by, in large part, your property tax dollars. This is why you have property taxes, quite frankly, is to use to go support these general fund activities, these operational type activities. There's a, several other funds that we don't have enough time to talk about every single one. Um, special revenue, they call it special revenue because it has to be used for a special purpose. The most uh, common example by far and away is road use tax dollars from the state. When people buy gas, there's a, a fuel tax. 
um, that goes to the state, the Iowa Department of Transportation then divvies that up. Some stays with the state for state highways. Some goes to the county governments for county roads. Some goes to cities for city roads, the roads that you are um, responsible for to, uh, to maintain and improve. And so the road use tax dollars must be used for road infrastructure expenses. So they're, they're called a special revenue because it has to be used for that special purpose. Okay. So that's a separate fund from your general fund. Um, and so you can track it. It's all about tracking and accounting. That's why we break these things out. Debt service. A lot of cities have debt uh, to pay for major capital projects, like a big road project or to purchase a new fire truck. And so you incur debt because you don't have enough cash on hand to pay for that in one lump sum. So you got to break out, break those funds out to track those separately. Um, TIF, not every, that's tax income and finance. Not nearly enough time to talk about tax income and finance in this one, but that's a, a for some cities that have a tax increment finance district uh, to support some kind of development project or to address slum and blight neighborhoods. They, um, create a tax increment finance di district TIF, and they can draw funds from that to pay back um, debt the city incurs to put to make investments in the infrastructure in those districts. So again, a separate fund, so those things can be tracked separately. And then the last big one would be proprietary. Um, that would be for city owned and operated service utility services, namely water and sewer, or water and wastewater. And so those are called proprietary or enterprise or business type activities because you have uh, services you're providing, you know, the cost to the city to, to provide those services and you charge rates to the customers to pay for those expenses, those operational expenses. So they're separate from the general fund because they're handled separately um, uh, from an accounting and financial perspective. I'm sure I've lost at least half the group by now. We've all been there. Try to stay patient. Um, you'll get it one day. So as I've kind of talked about here, a lot of what uh, why we have fund accounting is so we can accurately track and account for everything. And that is a very high standard in government, which we welcome and accept. Everything, every penny has to be accounted for. Why? Well, this is the public. Uh, these are public dollars that you're using to provide services. So everything has to be accounted for down to the penny. There's different ways cities do that. Most cities are on a cash basis type of accounting system. Some cities use GAAP or accrual. Some cities are modified. Doesn't really matter. You just have to account for these things. And that is a mandate from the state code, section 384.20. That's where the fund accounting requirement comes from. The state code requirement, you don't have a choice. You must account for everything that the city does on the revenue and expenditure side. Also includes your reserves, any kind of investments you might have, CDs, whatever the case may be, everything has to be accounted for. Um, uh, so there is a chart of accounts out there. If you haven't heard of that yet, we have it on our website um, in the uh, finance, finance section of our website. Uh, most cities use the chart of account, chart, uh, chart of accounts um, because it's been developed by uh, city clerks and finance officers and CPAs. Uh, it's a very handy tool. I would also say that pretty much every city out there now is using some kind of financial accounting software that is designed using the chart of accounts. And so the numbering system and the, the labeling systems already set up for you, but it still takes a lot of work to get familiar with it and to, to do it well. Uh, but just know that that is mandated to do something. Um, then there's a whole bunch of financial reporting, which we'll kind of wrap up with later. Uh, the whole point of that though, is again, that we are using public dollars to do all of our work. And so there's a high standard to make sure that you are reporting out to anyone, the citizens, your council, the state government on everything you're doing, all your financial activities. The big one being the annual financial report, which is due every, December 1 of every year. There's also audits and financial examination requ requirements of, of cities via chapter 11 of the state code and there's differences um, based on city populations. Every city over 2,000 population must do an annual audit. The cities below that threshold have to do financial examinations depending on their uh, size of their city budget. So just be aware that no matter what size of city you are, you're going to have to do some kind of either audit or financial examination at some point. Again, these are good exercises. They are going to help you um, perfect 
your accounting and your, your budgeting. Um, but the whole point of, again, is to make sure that it's transparent. Anyone can look at your financial activities and it, everything's going well, you're using your money wisely and so on and so forth. I talked before about financial software. If you are brand, brand new, um, that is probably one of the things I put on your homework is to try to uh, connect with your financial software provider and do some training with them. Uh, a lot of them have uh, reps who will be happy to sit down with you, kind of walk you through the the different widgets within your software. But that's, a that's again, a, a, a key homework assignment if you're brand new to your role. Um, there's other reporting, believe it or not, that you're going to need to do. And this is more of an internal type of thing. But every city, are, these are not mandated per se by the state government uh, or state code. But um, a lot of them are certainly best practices, if not mandated by your own internal financial policies. A lot of cities have their own internal financial policies that say, we must provide a monthly financial report to the city, city council. We must produce a cash report, um, an accounts payable report, a general ledger uh, that's quarterly and annual and so on and so on and so on. So there's differences from city to city on exactly what kind of treasury reports you might need to be producing. So double check your own sort of system and your standing op standard operating procedures. But even our smallest of cities, there's going to be at least a monthly financial report that you produce for your city council, um, if not some others as well. Um, a lot of again, there's going to be some differences based on your cities out there. Um, some cities will require their library to provide a financial report, either monthly or finan or quarterly. Uh, police and fire, same deal. If you have a police department or a fire department, fire department, you might require them to provide a report on their financial activities every so often. Public works is another example uh, where that might happen. And so, a lot of cities also will include kind of a balance remaining or a year to date. Um, the thing on where things stand, um, you know, we got four months left in the fiscal year. We're at 72% um, usage within our library budget. Okay, we're in good shape. If you're at 98%, okay, not such good shape because we still have four months to go. Got a quarter of the year left to go, uh, something like that. And so you might have to make some changes and make some adjustments. So, but that being said, all these reports are great. Just know what you, your, your council expects, what you expect from other, other departments as the case may be. Um, that leads us to city budgeting. And I talked about this before. We're right in the middle of budget season. We're actually getting toward the end of budget season for city governments. April 30 is the new deadline. Um, but as I'm sure any of the veterans on the call today would say, uh, it takes several months to get to the finish line. Uh, so April 30th is the deadline, but you really should be wrapping things up now. Uh, given all the different things that the state code requires to get your budget properly approved. But even before that, you have a lot of work internally with your council and your staff and the public to get to a place where you're ready to approve the budget. You're ready for your council to approve the budget. So it's a heck of a lot of work. It takes a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions, a lot of research, a lot of evaluating past budgets to get to that place, to get to the finish line. Uh, the budget itself, like any budget, it's a it's a planning document. You are looking at all the different things that your citizens demand of you. And then in most cities, you can't do it all. You, you're not ever gonna be able to handle all the citizen requests or handle all of your capital projects, all the road work that needs to be done in one fiscal year. So you got to plan it out. You got to prioritize what is most important for the next fiscal year, put that into that next fiscal year budget, and then allocate funding to get the job done. Uh, but it's a plan. You got to be nimble because things happen. Unexpected things happen like derechos and floods and any, any uh, uh, number of other things that can sort of interrupt the plan or disrupt your plan. You got to adjust. You got to do budget amendments on occasion, which is allowed in our state code of Iowa um, to make adjustments. Uh, the budget also places fiscal controls on the public funds um, that we can only use it for these things. Um, and that's what our council is gonna be doing when they approve the budget. Uh, it's a transparency tool, it's a monitor monitoring tool uh, to do reporting, evaluating both from internal perspective to evaluate budget performance. Are we allocating too much money for this thing? Not enough money for that thing? Um, are we out of whack over here or over there? 
uh, uh, but also for the public. So you can show to the public that, hey, we are meeting your demands or we cannot do this thing because we have limited resources. We cannot build this splash pad this year because we have other priorities this year. Maybe next year we can get to that splash pad. So it's also a public tool to show that like, look, this is what, how we're using your funds. So within all this is also cash management. And so most cities, I would hope every city has a cash management policy. This is kind of the checkbook, your cash flow, which is a lot different than you know, old uh, previous years where it was more of like an actual cash, uh, cash in hand type of policy. Of course, everything, uh, not everything, but most things done uh, these days are done digitally or electronically, but it's still a checkbook of sorts that you're having to manage on a day-to-day -day basis uh, where you're just it's like recording all the different revenues, all the things coming in, whether it's your property tax revenues that come in twice per year in big chunks or the more week to week stuff with utility payments and payments for um, permits and licenses and fines and penalties and on and on and on. Again, depends on your city, and what you provide and what kind of transactions you may have. But on the other side of it is expenditures, all the stuff you're having to pay for being able to provide the services that you provide your public. Uh, the routine stuff like keeping the lights on and paying for cell phones and internet and all of that, but also equipment like uh, shovels and uh, a gear for your firefighters and so on and so forth. All of those come with a transaction, of course. So even though a lot of things are done online today with ACH accounts and online billing and payments and whatnot, you still need to track every single one of those and have a system to manage your cash and so you know exactly what's on hand and what's coming in and what's going out. Same uh, thought process with investments. And this is gonna be much more of a city by city situation on just what kind of investments are out there. The state code does put some pretty strict controls on this, which is smart because these are public dollars. So you don't wanna be investing in anything that's speculative like stocks, you're not allowed to invest in that as a city government um, because of the state code requirements to have safety and liquidity and a solid rate of return. And so uh, there's something called the Iowa Public Agency Investment Trust, IPATE, that a lot of cities are involved with as sort of an investment um, firm that is set up for city governments and, and local governments. Um, a lot of cities also work with their local banks to do CDs, just good old fashioned CDs, because those are uh, allowed under the state code of Iowa, and um, they provide some rate of return, better these days than uh, a few years ago, that's for sure. Uh, so if you have investments, you got to track those as well to the penny. Oops, let me move forward here. So the other thing about all of this stuff, uh, not just with your cash management policies, but all of your accounting and financial work is that you are trying to prevent fraud. Um, uh, whether that's internal, external, doesn't really matter. And so uh, you'll hear auditors talk about internal controls. What does that mean? Basically having some kind of system in place that does reconciliations. Somebody, a second person, a third person is checking all of the transaction history, the ledgers, uh, the checkbook, uh, whatever, whatever you got in place that everything is matching up. That the that the what we're reporting as expenditures is accurate. What we're reporting as revenues is accurate. They're in place. They're coming in um, as reported, and everything reconciles, ties out the way it's supposed to. So the next area we're going to talk about here a little bit is fraud and theft. And what are we looking at? It, and there's any number of examples out there. Is internal and external? Is it somebody, uh, a city official, walking out the door with cash? And that's again, as I talked before, not a lot of cities are carrying as much cash as they used to. But you still have some cash probably somewhere uh, in City Hall or if you have like a, a rec programs where it kept people paying cash, concession stands, things like that. You still have cash that you're trying to manage and, and protect. Um, so it could be someone, a city official, city employee walking out, literally walking out with cash in their hand. It could be a customer, utility customer disconnecting the water meter. So when they're watering the lawn or filling up their swimming pool, they're not getting charged for those thousands of gallons of water going into their swimming pools. That's theft, right? Could be misuse of public funds. You are um, approving funds to be used for something that's not a public purpose. That's not an appropriate thing that your council's actually approved. 
Uh, it could be fraud, somebody misusing funds in a way that's personal. They're, they're benefiting from that. They're budging the books um, to make it look one way, but they're actually pocketing some money. Um, the, the other thing, too, as it's the city government as a whole, all of your funds, all of your resources, all of your time has to be used for a public purpose. That's from the Iowa Constitution. So does does some kind of transaction or use of funds, use of city staff time meet the public purpose test? That's always underlying everything you do as a city government. It has to be for a public purpose. Uh, so that's another part to that. So that kind of leads into the ethical stuff that it comes with working in city government. Um, and that's just a, for everybody. City clerks, elected officials, doesn't matter. There's always ethical considerations as part of working in the public sector. Um, and it's frankly a higher standard, I would say, than pretty much any other profession or any other industry out there. Um, because again, everything you do is for the public. Uh, so any kind of unethical thing may violate the public's trust, if not violate of state code or a city code for that matter. So some of the questions that uh, we always ask is to kind of pass the stink test. Uh, does it smell right to you? If it doesn't, or to the mayor and council, it's probably not worth doing, whatever it is. If it doesn't pass that basic kind of just standards, that stink test, it's probably not right. And this is where I stop and say, I sat in a class probably 20 years ago when I first got into city government and uh, was sitting in a class on uh, ethics. And it was the basic premise was just because it's legal doesn't make it right. Okay. And that's ethics in a nutshell. There's certain things that are certainly illegal. They're in the state code. We all know what they are. You know, you can't steal, you can't do stuff like that. But there's other things that may be technically legal under the state code of Iowa, but are unethical as a public official. So that's why we have all these ethical questions and considerations for folks. So that's another question we always say, even if it's legal, would you be proud of it? Would you be willing to support it and defend it if there was a story of, about it in the Des Moines Register, whatever that it is? Um, I always think of a story when I first joined the league, there was kind of a, a dust up in a city, a small town, where the mayor's street and driveway got plowed first um, by the city snowplow uh, operator. And it was, it was problematic in two ways. One is um, most cities plow their streets in a very thoughtful fashion, where they start with the busiest streets first, right? Pretty co common sense. Uh, we need to get those streets cleared first. So why is the mayor's street on a residential street getting plowed first? That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Secondly, the mayor's driveway is a private driveway. And the city plowing a private driveway is, is not kosher. And so that story did make it into the register, if, me if memory serves, and it did not make the city look good, and they quickly put a stop to it. So those are things like that where you got to think about, are we, is this best is for the public? Is this something that we can defend publicly if it uh, showed up in a newspaper somewhere? The other thing, too, is there a conflict of interest, which is typically more for our elected officials, where there's laws that say you cannot use the powers of your office to reward yourself or gain financially or personally or for a family member, but it can also apply to city staff like city clerks. Um, if you use your powers of your office in some way um, to gain personally or financially or to reward a family member in some fashion that is not um, uh, okay, it's not lawful, it's not uh, ethically okay. Uh, so you gotta be careful of that stuff as well. And that kind of leads into that next part where there's related parties that you, um, through your own personal life, that you're kind of swaying things using your powers of city in the city of government to gain the to help them gain in a way that's not ethical. So always be aware of that. It's just a, again, it's kind of higher standard that we all have working in local government or public the public sector. All right. If there's any questions, keep using that Q and A. Um, we don't have any right now, so I'll keep on moving forward here. I'll keep an eye on the clock as well. As usual, I talk way too much and I'll try to keep going here a little bit quicker. Some other things here uh, to be mindful of. Um, there's policies galore. If you there's another homework assignment, not just on financial stuff, just all of your policies, employment policies, but certainly like purchasing policies, 
uh, accounting policies, financial policies, get familiar with those now if you haven't already. That's a big part of being a city clerk is working within the structure of our policies and standard operating procedures. Most cities have some kind of purchase and purchasing policy that gets into um, what we can purchase, when they can, when it can be purchased, how much can be purchased. Some cities also get into um, basic routine purchases can be done prior to a council meeting and getting council approval um, up to a certain threshold, all good and fine, but it should be in a policy first. And then also those policies will talk about, as we mentioned before, reconciliations and records, getting invoices, uh, purchase orders. There's all sorts of different ideas out there. Uh, so just, again, be familiar with what your policies have in place. Another one, just be just another homework assignment. Um, be aware of this thing called CIPs, capital improvement plans. Strongly encouraged for every city out there to have them. Great planning tool to help strategize and prioritize all the different things your city is going to face. Even small towns are going to have at some point to do infrastructure work on the roads and bridges and sewers, uh, sewer lines, water lines, infra all the infrastructure goes into that, let alone uh, fire trucks and police cars and city hall and the public workshop and the fire station and on and on and on. Most cities use a capital improvement plan to help, again, prioritize that out, allocate funding. Usually they are three to five years in length. So it's another homework assignment. Hopefully you have a CIP in place now. Go If you do so, go get familiar with that. If you don't, I would probably go to my council and say, it's time for us to get a CIP in place. Probably take you several months to get one finalized, um, but it's definitely worth it to have in place. Another area that city clerks are typically going to help with or, or manage entirely is all the city's insurance, contracts, uh, workers' comp, safety programs. We call it risk management as kind of a big header, but there's a lot that can go into it. Uh, we already talked about surety bonds or public official bonds. Uh, 28E agreements, those are the joint services agreements that cities and counties and school districts will um, come together on in a lot of times to do joint services and share equipment, share facilities, but they also need insurers, insurance. Um, and so that's another thing to look into. When you're working with service providers, you ought to have contracts for one thing. They also should have performance bonds slash insurance of their own. If they do not, guess who's gonna, going to be the backup plan if there are problems with damages or something like that. It's going to be the city government. So you want to make sure all of your contracts, um, the provider has adequate insurance. Uh, and then liability. Every city has to have liability insurance, of course, to protect all of your buildings and facilities and equipment and property. And so make sure that's up to snuff. Um, I'm sure your city has it in place, but just know of it and be aware of it. Same with workers comp. You have to have workers compensation for all of your city officials, which includes your city council. Uh, so I'm sure you have it in place already. Just be aware of it, uh, but get familiar with it when you get time. Within that is conducting safety um, programs and training. Uh, cannot stress how important it is to have good safety protocols in place and policies, but also to have a safety committee and have timely safety training with your staff. Um, every year we see this in the news and I, I the League of Cities, one of our endorsed programs and the folks that work with us just across the hall here is called the Iowa Municipalities Workers Compensation Program, IMWCA. I'm sure some on the call have them as their insurance workers comp insurance provider. They do excellent work. It's a pool formed for cities and counties, local governments. And so they that's that's their client. It's you guys. And they have safety um, uh, and risk and uh, staff who go out and work with cities to improve their safety programs and improve safety so they have less claims, frankly, make people, uh, make things safer. Nobody wants to deal with a situation where someone gets hurt on the job. Um, those are very tough situations, obviously. And then get down toward the end here. Again, we don't have enough time today to talk about all the different things, but there's a heck of a lot of reporting that you are mandated as a city government to handle each year. A lot of it is financial in nature. A lot of it is redundant. And we always talk about there's a big dream a lot of veterans have out there. Oh, we got one big report to handle all of this. Before my career is over, gosh, I wish we can get we'll get that done. I I, I don't want to make a promise, but we're gonna work, we're gonna get there one day. 
Uh, but just be aware of this stuff. And we had a several questions on this in the pre, uh, when people registered about all the different reports that link to the 2024 city calendar. The league puts out a calendar each year that Amanda and I work on that lists out all of the different reports that you have to have by deadline. A lot of them are December 1. There's a few others that are different times throughout the year. Uh, but December 1 is kind of the big deadline, um, for especially the financial reports. But that calendar will show you exactly what you need to file each year and what and what and when. So just use that. Um, obviously, ask us questions. Ask your uh, mentors and veterans out there for additional help on what exactly is handled. And we got a little screenshot. I forgot about this. Got a little screenshot to show you what that calendar looks like. It is also located on our website in the City Clerk Resources page. City Clerk Resources page is housed under there. Twenty twenty four City Calendar. We do it every year. And it lists out again everything that's going on out there. And then last, I kind of talked about this before, but it's audits and examinations. Just be aware that every city has to do something each year. Don't get freaked out. A lot of people, when they think about audits, whether it's public sector or private sector, they kind of get nervous. They're going to find something that we did wrong, that I'm a lousy uh, accountant, that I haven't done my job correctly. Don't think about it that way. Try to think about it as it's going to improve your accounting, it's going to improve your budget. It's going to give you some ideas on how to make improvements, and it gives you a new set of clean numbers. So it's really a valuable tool. I'm not going to say it's easy, like it can be time consuming, and sometimes they are going to be critical of the city's uh, financial policies or transaction policies or what have you. And, and you got, but take it to heart. It, it's really meant to improve how you handle everything. So to summarize all of this in a hour long discussion about city clerk. Again, we could spend an entire week talking about all the stuff you guys do and required to do, but there's a lot of moving pieces. City government, I think it's really strange and for folks, those that are new to it, it moves really slowly on purpose because you are using public dollars. These are public services. And so there's a lot of safeguards in place to make sure you're doing things correctly. So it can move very slowly, but at the same time, there's a whole bunch of stuff moving on around you all at the same time. And the other thing for city clerks, they'll tell you, the veterans will tell you is you can have your day all mapped out, your list of things to do on Wednesday, March 13th. And all it takes is one citizen coming into the city hall to completely blow up your plan. <laughs> and now that becomes your priority and it pushes everything off to the side. And that's tough. It is tough. When I worked for a city, that was like the hardest thing just for my mental way of things. I'm a, you know, a list maker and a check the box kind of guy, citizen would come in and just like, it was hard to wrap my head around like, well, now that's my priority because my council told me that this citizen needs to be dealt with. There you go. There, there you go. That's what you're doing that day. Uh, so there's a lot of that, a lot of questions. People are going to look at you as experts to know everything that's going on in your city and more. They think that you also know everything that's going on at your county and your schools and your state and what's going on at that business and that bar. <laughs> it's like, they look at you as knowing everything and it's, it's gonna be tif difficult to handle it all. A lot of responsibilities, a lot of questions, a lot of ask for help. Um, it just goes on and on. So there's a lot of people out there that wanna help you though. Uh, there's a lot of training. It's kind of talked about IMFOA, MPI, um, the League of Cities, of course, we do a lot of training throughout the year. So use us, use all these different resources, use the clerk mentors. Um, use the veterans with around your you know, around your county, veteran city clerks. There are so many super helpful people out there that understand the struggle it is to be a brand new city clerk and they want to help. So don't be a stranger. Ask for help. Ask people to, to chime in. There's plenty more outside of that. Use your city attorney. If you have any kind of economic development work and financial activity going on, like tax increment finance or anything like that, use your bond attorneys, the bond council. Um, tap into the veterans on your staff, the local bankers who have probably worked with your city for years. State Auditor's Office has a lot of great people out there. Um, all the different state agencies that work with cities like the DNR, uh, Economic Development, Ted Nelson at the Department of Management. Right now it's budget season. He's working with cities all day, every day. So uh, the bottom line is there's a lot of folks out there that want to help, but just build your network. Um, we want to help you. You're not only in this alone. All right. Um, we're going to get to questions next year. Just be mindful of um, 
the upcoming study halls. We're going to do these quarterly. And so they're going to be kind of around the same time, like Wednesdays at 10 a.m. over the next uh, several months of the year. And they are going to be recorded like today's was recorded. So a question on that I saw. And so we're going to record each one of them. We're going to post them to the city website or the league website, I should say. And so anyone can watch them after the fact and enjoy that. Um, so we have some questions here. Let me, I answered yeah. most of them just okay. typing. So the one that came up uh, that you haven't answered already is MPI and MPA, uh, the date change from July to June. So that is true. That's new this year. They're going to try something different. Um, yep. And then it was just our sessions recorded, future sessions. I think there's a couple more in there. Um, yeah. Let's see. If you want to go look at the new open ones, there's some yeah, bigger I ones in there. Those now. Um, and I know we're already at time, but I'll stay on for a while here. I, you know, if everybody needs to hop off, we are recording this, uh, but I'll just go through these as, as much as we can. Uh, so the first one, the Quad Cities has recently moved to column and they want to send proof of publications electronically. Is that acceptable? Yes, um, that is acceptable. Basically, you cannot dictate to a newspaper on where they place public notices, council meeting minutes, which would be the two main things that you need to publish as a city government if you're over 200 in population, along with summaries of ordinances for cities that are over 200 in population and do not have a newspaper published in their city. You have to publish ordinances when your council approves one or a summary of the ordinance when that is the case. Um, so a newspaper like the Quad City Times, a lot of them have sort of a legal notices section where they put all that stuff in. Public notices, legal notices, council meeting minutes, county board minutes, all that stuff. Uh, but if they want to put it in a column or some other section of their uh, newspaper, they can do so. Uh, proofs of publications, those have changed a lot here in recent years. And I've heard from more and more cities that a lot of those local newspapers are actually using some kind of third provider to do affidavits or proofs of publication coming from Wisconsin, I've heard, Texas, another city, whatever. Um, they send it electronically. That does count. Um, I know auditors, I've heard from other cities where some auditors are like, where's your proof? Why didn't you publish or print it and put it in your kind of your um, affidavit book? And that's kind of old school, but um, the electronic version does count. And so I would kind of push back on that if you get a finding from an auditor on that. Also, also, the state legislature has a bill before them now that we hope, fingers crossed, that would modernize all this stuff with all the publications, notices, including proofs of publication or affidavits that would be all streamlined with a state website uh, where all this could be housed and handled and it'd be much more efficient and much more streamlined. That's not in place yet, so I don't want to make any promises, but we hope that becomes the case. Makes a heck of a lot more sense in this day and age with digital everything. So, um, at the long winded answer as usual for me, but yeah, electronic uh, proofs are fine. Um, regarding Cindy's question, she asked if we had a list of auditors because she's having issues um, getting the auditor. I did recommend the state, and she said they hadn't returned her call. So I don't know if you have any other suggestions, Mickey. Yeah. This comes up a lot these days. So the state auditor's office had their budget cut five years ago, I want to say, and they had a, they lost several auditors who would do local budget audits uh, directly. So we've heard the last couple of years that they it's just really come down to a trickle now on how many cities they can do each year. Um, there is something called the Iowa Society of CPAs. They have a search tool that I would use. Um, it's very basic. You just search you know, city of Riverdale, and they should give you some hits within your region. This is another issue, though, where there's a dwindling number of CPAs. There's actually an article, I think, in today's register um, talking about the issue with there's not as many CPAs out there as there used to be. And so um, that's also complicates matters when you need any auditor, whether it's a state auditor's office or a, a, a private CPA to get a, a city audit done. You're kind of at their mercy. Uh, I will say this, though. The state auditor's office has been pretty understanding with this because if um, you are required to get an annual audit done or a financial examination done, there are deadlines for that. But I've heard that they've been pretty lenient because of these problems of just getting anyone to do it. And so they'll give you extensions 
if you fall into that situation, but you still got to do it eventually. Uh, let's see, next year we got Sabrina. Besides the list of courses required through, I believe, through IS, ISU Extension, is there a way to see our progress as far as clerk certification? So clerk certification is actually done by IMFOA. And I know we've got, I think I've barred barracks on here. I, I saw a couple of names that are, um, IMFOA has its own board and there's also a certification committee. They could probably talk more about like how this all works. I'm not an expert on it by any means, but they're the ones who actually do clerk certification. And then clerk school or MPI, MPA at ISU extension, those classes count towards the credit you need to obtain and maintain your certification. There's other classes too, like the league's budget workshops or our conference and some other events will also count toward the credit that you need for certification. Um, but I'm a way manages all that. So that's where to go to look and see what you need or what you've got currently um, as you work towards your certification or trying to maintain your certification. Um, all right, Ginger. Good to hear from you, Ginger. Uh, when I convey state law rules, et cetera, to my council to ensure we are compliant for open meetings and reporting financials, et cetera, why do I feel like I am overstepping my title as city clerk? Oh boy, is it is it our job to inform and make sure we are following the rules? This is something that I think nearly every city clerk struggles with, especially early on in their tenure, mainly because um, it, it, the, the position duties and expectations are different from city to city. Uh, some city clerks are honestly more city managers or city administrators where they are expected to be, do all the city clerk duties, but also really be like a manager and like kind of tell your council what's up when it comes to following rules and policies. And we need to plan for this and we need to put this in the budget and you need a public hearing on that. And the council relies on them to basically be a manager, right? Like there's, it's not just, just, I hate to use that phrase, but just clerk duties. Uh, you're really taking on a management type responsibilities. Other cities, that's not the case. And the clerk is more or less expected to uh, be quiet during council meetings and kind of follow the council's lead and, and, and just kind of handle the basics of the job. And that's it. So that's where I think it kind of depends on the city, Ginger, whether, um, you know, if your council looks at you as more of a administrator or manager type to really know it all and report to the council and tell them what's going on. Okay, that's part of the job. I would probably tell me to pay me more uh, because you're really looking at me as more of a manager. That's fine, you know, but uh, other cities, it might be less the case. So that's where... It's hard for me to give you a flat answer or straight answer because it just depends a lot on each city out there. All right, we have some other questions I want to hit on that came in from the group prior to the meeting. I'm going to try to summarize these as best as possible. I know we're past time and I want to, if, if you need to hop off, go ahead and hop off. Um, there's a lot of different questions on sort of council meetings and the role of the clerk, the role of the council, who does what, who does this. Um, how do we hold a public hearing and all that? So I'm going to hit on a few things. First is um, the whole, like, well, I just kind of touched on this with Ginger's question, but basically the council is your boss. They are at the top of the city structure. Well, the citizens are really at the top because they elect the council. I'm putting my hands on the screen here. And then the council sets the directives. They are in charge. They provide oversight. So you always have to be respectful of that. OK, that's that includes the larger cities that have a city manager or a police chief. They still have to work under the council's direction. So who do you respond to? Who do you report to? It's always ultimately the council. That being said, some cities have a city manager or a city administrator, or they've granted the city clerk more managerial type duties. And so in those cases, you might have another person that's got some managerial power that you might have to um, respond to or work under as a city clerk. So that's another one where it's each city can be a little bit different. You got to know what your city structure is, the chain of command, duties, responsibilities, authorities, all that good stuff. The council decides things in public meetings. So this is what a lot of questions on city council meetings, kind of just like the basics of it. Public meetings, council meetings are public meetings. 
Again, we talked about the open innings laws. Get familiar with those familiar with those if you haven't already. But that's what a council decides the city business. You have an agenda, they vote on it. That's their job. You then and the rest of the staff carry out their directives as a staff. Um, but that's those meetings, you set them up for success. It's how I was kind of taught back in the day is your job as a city clerk and city staff is to set the council up for success by providing them homework or research, I should say, and providing them re uh, options for different policies and the budget and city codes and ordinances and all that stuff. So your job is to kind of set them up, help them prepare. Their job is to make decisions by voting. They're the legislative branch, the council is. The mayor is sort of the presiding officer of the council. And for the cities that do not have a city administrator, they are the boss. They are the chief administrative officer under the state code of Iowa. And so they are typically the, 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 the main boss you'll have as a city clerk for the cities that do not have a city administrator, okay? Um, I've had several questions on public hearings, which I'm sure is connected to the city budget process. So I wanna draw a line uh, in the sand and provide some guidance on that. Most of your public hearings, your city council is not required by the state code to formally schedule. Okay, to say the council doesn't have to formally schedule them with an approval prior to the hearing. Most public hearings, you can simply drop onto an agenda when necessary. Okay, here's where it gets confusing. For the budget hearings, there's two of them. The proposed property tax rate hearing that you should be getting ready to hold here very soon. And then the annual budget public hearing, which is at the end of the process. Uh, but before March, before April 30th, um, those two public hearings, the state code says the council shall schedule them. So they have to count, the council has to formally schedule those uh, at a previous council meeting to get them set up. Okay. So those are unique. Is If you have a local policy that says our council must formally schedule all public hearings, fine, totally fine. Even for the ones that don't require it by the state code, just follow that policy. So again, we had a lot of questions on that, which I'm sure was in relation to these budget public hearings that we're going through right now. So hopefully that explained it. But again, ask us questions if, uh, if you're confused about any of that. Um, another one that I wanted to talk about, we got a few different questions related to this, was sort of the council's role um, in managing the staff. I kind of talked about with the mayor but also kind of like in public when they talk about city this and city that, whether that's on social media or they're at the local tap or at the grocery store. And this is something when we talk to council members, we always try to tell them never make any promises on behalf of the city because the only time you can really formally make a promise is in a council meeting with your voting powers. Individual council members have no power. The only time they have powers, they operate as a group, a majority by voting on resolutions and ordinances and motions. So a council member out in the public or on social media should never say the city will do this or the city will never do that. They can't technically make those kinds of commitments or promises. Um, so if you're seeing that, you may go to the mayor, you may go to the city attorney if you're having problems with council member behavior um, to sort of say, hey, this council member is making promises that the council hasn't voted on. I don't think that's right. So the mayor may need to step in and say, as a reminder to all of the council, when you're out talking to the public, that you can say at most, we'll look into it. I agree that that's a concern or I agree that that's a great idea. We'll look into it. If and if the, if the council approves it, we'll do it. If the council approves it, we'll stop it, whatever it is. Uh, but that's really the, how it should work. Uh, but again, we have several questions kind of about the council's role in interacting with the public. But I would also say that for staff, such as city clerks, don't make promises until the council has given you the green light or the red light, uh, as the case may be. Uh, you always got to follow their lead. And so if a citizen comes to you in city hall or approaches you on the street and says, I want the city to do this, or I want the city to stop doing that, the most same same concept. All you can say is, yeah, I'll take it to the council or, you, or encourage them to take it to their elected representatives. Like, why don't you, I'm the city clerk, I don't get to vote on things. Go talk to your council. That's an appropriate response. Um, I'm going to stop there with the questions because there's a whole bunch of other ones that are kind of one-offs here and there. 
I would encourage you all to ask us questions at the league um, after this and throughout. We will hold, again, another several study halls throughout the year. We're sort of um, up in the air on how we're going to shape the next several. We might make them more just fully Q&As. We might zero in on a couple um, important areas of interest like financial accounting and city budgets. I think we'll do one, at least one on that topic area alone, uh, given how much that is part of the city clerk job. Uh, but we're open to ideas. So Amanda and I are here to, if you have ideas for future sessions or questions that come up, please let us know. We're here to help you guys.